to our panel, Academic Integrity in an Interconnected World. Uh, I want to recognize those of you who are joining us remotely and also to uh, welcome you. Uh, we'll call this our food for thought session uh, because we will overlap uh, the lunch hour. So uh, we hope you'll gorge yourselves uh, on this particular panel. Uh, I'm Greg Von Lehman. I'm special assistant to the president for cybersecurity at the University of Maryland University College. And uh, I'm privileged to moderate uh, this very talented panel this morning. And I just wanted to uh, maybe take moderator's privilege to offer a few comments that uh, might provide one frame for thinking about uh, this session's issue. So when we think about the internet, uh, and the risks that we're exposed to uh, as a result, I think we tend to worry about risks to things. I think we tend to worry about risks to things. For example, when we worry about data breaches, uh, like the exposure of our student records as an example, we're thinking about the risk to a thing, digitized data. And digitized data is a thing, we can measure it. You know, your hard drive's full or the server's full. We might worry about ransomware as another example. Uh, in this case, we're thinking about the risk most immediately to our computers and to our networks, the risk that these would be locked down uh, for a sustained period of time so that we would not be able to communicate with our students, communicate internally, uh, provide services to our students, uh, and so forth. Once again, we're talking about the risk to a thing. But the internet also enables risks to intangibles. And some of these are extremely important. And when they're compromised, the consequences can be equally uh, or even more far reaching for the institution than a data breach or even a ransomware attack. And I would say that academic integrity uh, is one of those intangibles. And the theme of this session is that it's an intangible that is at increased risk and that there can be some significant consequences if this is not a managed risk. And so our panel will help us to understand um, as a baseline what academic integrity is, why it's at risk, what are the consequences uh, of a compromise. And of course, there's no such thing as perfect security but how can we reduce the opportunity uh, for this compromise? So with that, our, I'll let our panel introduce themselves. Uh, we'll follow with uh, some, question, some discussion uh, that will uh, follow from some guiding questions. And we'll leave about 10 or 15 minutes uh, at the end for your questions, both for those in the room and those who may want to contribute uh, remotely. Let me mention uh, that unfortunately, um, uh, we're missing one of our panelists, Adele Lalo from Western Governors University, tried valiantly to get here. Uh, two canceled flights, he's stranded in Denver from Salt Lake City. Uh, and so we're fortunate that one of our panelists is also from Western Governors um, and will channel Adele uh, in this, this conversation. So, uh, so let's start with our uh, introducing our panel and Jennifer, let's start with you. Good morning. Okay. Good morning to everyone. I'm Jennifer Douglas. I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies and Research at American Public University System. If you're not familiar with APUS, uh, we are an adult serving institution with online programs. We were founded as American Military University and that's still our uh, more well-known nomenclature. Uh, so we're very heavily military and veteran serving institution um, and our average age of undergraduate student is 33. I'm on the graduate side of the house. The average age of our master's student is 37. You know, so we definitely have adults who are in the full swing of their work and career lives. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and be part of this discussion. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm Maureen O'Brien. I'm currently Director of Evaluation at Western Governors University. We have over 100,000 students, as Mark mentioned this morning, also adult learners. Um, I've been interested in this topic and for, uh, as a faculty member, and now I have the responsibility for academic 
um, authentic, authenticity, and that includes educating our students on what that means, as well as um, detecting and, and deterring that kind of behavior, as, as well as you know, keeping an eye on what's going on in the industry and, and educating our students and other people about what that what is happening. And that's why I'm so happy that you're all here today. As a competency-based education, our assessments are how we know the students have the learning that they are, um, that we are providing them a degree for. So that the assessment and being, knowing that we're actually assessing their competence is critical to us. So thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Greg, and, and everyone. And I especially want to thank uh, uh, Deb and the Quality Matters team for having this panel. Um, I think part of what you're going to see in the process of this discussion is the need for greater visibility and uh, transparency and collaboration across the profession around this issue. And so I'm really grateful to, to Quality Matters for their longstanding commitment to integrity and for continuing to evolve that discussion here. I'm Doug Harrison. I'm the Associate Dean of the Graduate School at uh, UMUC. Uh, it's not a coincidence that our, our, our institutional profiles are not dissimilar. Uh, we are um, almost entirely online uh, with about 100,000 students as well. Globally, we have about an average age of 34. Um, a little over half of our students are military affiliated. Uh, and so uh, this is not a, an issue that's unique to online education, as we'll discover later. Uh, but the, the importance of integrity and the threats are, are elevated for, um, uh, for, for institutions heavily invested online. Um, I, and for the last 18 months, have been leading the university's um, renewed commitment to integrity formed around what we call the Academic Integrity Work Group, and I'll talk more about uh, kind of the comprehensive approach that we've tried to take to that. But just quickly, I'll say it responded to two key drivers. One was internal. Uh, we're evolving a new learning model that's infused with competency and experiential and scenario-based learning, uh, and we really thought that we wanted to be intentional about surfacing uh, how integrity could be meaningfully infused across the curriculum uh, at all levels and particularly how it operates in specific disciplines and, and, and career fields. Uh, and, and we thought that was a real opportunity for us. But we're also responding uh, uh, to the rise of the new cheating economy, which we'll talk more about today. Uh, and again, that threat is not unique to us or to online learning, but we are hearing, we, we heard loudly in our engagements with faculty that this is a great and growing threat. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that means, uh, but we're, our need to take, our desire to take a comprehensive approach was really um, driven by the, those internal and those external factors. Thanks. Well, Doug, don't give up the microphone. Let's uh, start with the uh, definition of terms. So what do we mean by academic integrity? Is, is it bigger than uh, academic misconduct? Absolutely. I think, I think that's the very first place to start. So when we talk about integrity, I think it's really important that we don't get pulled into a deficit model uh, thinking about it. Um, academic integrity is not simply the absence of misconduct. Uh, and if you do some cultural analysis of your institution, I suspect that a critical mass of your faculty will probably be there. It's not a criticism of faculty at all because they're on the front lines of this. Uh, but academic integrity is really the cornerstone of academic quality. Uh, we can't do any effective educating, no teaching and learning experience is successful if integrity is not implicitly and explicitly infused throughout that experience. Um, so one of the things we did at UMUC when we started this conversation was say, yes, we're responding to some drivers that are, that are threatening our integrity in terms of contract cheating, uh, but we don't want to start there. We don't want to start in that reactive position. And so we pulled back and said, what is our institutional vision of the place, the positive place of integrity in teaching and learning in UMUC? And that drove us to a definition of integrity that said, integrity is really more than just the absence of misconduct. It is the way that we know that students are able to understand and do what it is that we would think they should be able to do with a credential from UMUC. And that allows them to be authentic and uh, self-actualizing throughout life and work. So it's really a critical component, uh, aside from what happens when there are lapses of integrity. Uh, so it's educationally beneficial, it's socially necessary, and it's professionally valuable. Uh, we think that's worth defending and celebrating on its own while also having a strong account, structures of accountability when there are lapses of integrity. Um, it is not, uh, uh, these lapses to integrity are not unique to the online environment, certainly not to UMUC, uh, but I think it's not a coincidence that online institutions are elevating this conversation in a way that many more conventional institutions may not be uh, because we really have a high stake in, in, in what's at risk as, as Greg was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to echo Doug's approach because I think we are fundamentally academic institutions. We're, we're trying to educate um, our, our, the people who are attending our schools and part of educating is understanding what is integrity and, and how to act with integrity and, and why that's important. And so I do think we have a certain onus to, 
to actually provide some context for why it's important and why we why we would want to hold them to these standards and why they would want to hold themselves to these standards. And I think just to step back, really to see again higher education as a social good. And the reason that we're here, the reason that we're in higher education is to provide um, that opportunity for students and to think about closing that skills gap and that employer gap that we've seen, we've talked about in a lot of contexts is to articulate why, why that higher education is important and you know, why the student is there and why we are so dedicated to this mission. So um, Doug, you mentioned this, um, this concept of a cheating economy. So what I'm visualizing is out there um, uh, on the internet, you have um, these storefront vendors uh, that are providing quote unquote services. Um, so, um, so talk a bit about the cheating economy. And, uh, and also a question, is this a problem that's just for online institutions or is it also brick and mortar institutions? Yeah, so if there's a, a refrain here today, it's not online only. Uh, well, let's keep saying that. I'm right, right it above your, your doorpost, right? Um, because that's a really important component of, of building the coalitions around this that I talked about earlier. Um, it, I presented uh, some work that we, we've been doing at the institution to a group of, of senior academic leaders from a range of different institutional types a few months ago and really kind of challenged them at the end and encouraged them to join uh, this kind of, um, uh, if Adele were here, he would probably use the, the phrase coalition of the willing. Um, well, we, we think that's a safe term now, enough time has passed. Um, and a lot of the more traditional institutions uh, were a little wary, frankly, of, of, of sort of joining um, in, 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 the, in the good fight, uh, frankly, out of a fear that joining would be a tacit acknowledgement that there's a problem. And that uh, is a threat to, to, to brand, right, to reputation. Um, when, when Greg talks about risk, uh, that, that's, I think, what's core here is, is the risk to our reputation and brand. At UMUC, we've decided to say that's absolutely true. Our quality is our brand. That's our competitive marketable difference. And so we want, we want to be very public and transparent about, about that. So what, what's the threat look like? Uh, the new cheating economy really is, a, uh, is an umbrella term for a range of commercialized enterprises that are almost entirely online. Um, the heart of it is contract cheating. Uh, which is paying someone else to do some or all of your work. In many cases in online learning, uh, there might be uh, cyber intrusions with uh, a student surrendering their, their credentials to that contract cheater and allowing that contract cheater to enter the classroom as them. Uh, there are a lot of downstream bad effects that come from that, not least of all is harvesting what PII they can get from other students, reaching out to those students and soliciting additional business from those students. Um, sometimes on the basis of how successful they've been with other students in the classroom. This creates an enormous set of, uh, of, of problems with your trust with your students because students often think that the first thing, uh, they, they get an outreach from someone who says, I'm a tutor, I've helped other people in your class, would you like me to help you too? Uh, and they know that UMUC offers tutoring. Many of them understandably think that we're somehow involved in facilitating that transaction. That's a huge problem for your trust with your students. Uh, and just with the integrity and security of your classroom. Uh, so contract cheating is the core of the new cheating economy, um, but it's really, uh, it's really transacted or facilitated by commercial websites whose kind of gateway drug to this is encouraging students to upload all, some or all of the teaching and learning materials from their classrooms. The more they upload, the more access they get to other material in other of their classes that they haven't um, had yet. So if you've taken MBA 620 and you upload all of that, you'll get a discount or maybe you'll get free access to MBA 630 and MBA 640 that other students have populated. So it, uh, these sites then have this sort of transactional web around them or satellite uh, where these sort of independent contractors then make connections with students to then additionally do work. Uh, Greg um, uh, talked briefly about um, the, the marketing and I think what changes this, these aren't new behaviors. People have been engaging in this kind of corruption since the dawn of education, unfortunately. But what is new here is the scale and is the sophistication of uh, very uh, corporatized and well-developed marketing uh, apparatus has been attached to this and scaled out. And these sites really present themselves as tutoring help. Don't, do you want tutoring help? Don't you wanna help other students by sharing your teaching and by sharing your notes? Uh, and so all of this uh, creates a sense of students really thinking that they're engaging in socially beneficial activities. That, the, the perniciousness of that is very different than the classic um, test bank in a rusty file cabinet 
in, uh, in, in a Greek life house somewhere that has been the historic uh, image we've had of cheating. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a very different game and it's a big business. Uh, and we've surrendered a lot of that space in higher education uh, by, by just not responding. And I think that's one of the reasons why we think it's so important to have these kind of uh, systematic responses that I think we can talk about a bit more. So Doug, you mentioned um, this, this idea of students thinking that they're doing a socially beneficial thing and responding to these uh, solicitations. Um, Maureen, I know you've done some research kind of about the, the, the sociology of this phenomenon. And so would you wanna, uh, so I guess the question is, are these students uh, bad actors um, or are, are they operating under uh, maybe a different understanding of, of, of what they're doing? Well, I think really the reason we feel so strongly we need to get this message out and ask everyone to join in the fight is because these, we really believe that our students are being attacked by these predatory companies that are coming after them. And, and you know, uh, it's, we've talked about it's not necessarily generational. I think we're in an environment where we've um, raised problem solving, a lot of collaborative behavior, a lot of encouraging um, to work across the aisle, you know, join in together, work with your team, a lot of group work growing up. It's very hard sometimes for our students to discern that this is actually different. This is crossing a line. Where is that line? You know, and so we feel like there's this A, B, C approach, the antecedents, behaviors, consequences. We need to line out for them the antecedents in terms of what is academic integrity? What, is, what are the standards? When we say original work, what does that mean? And, and even to the point of, you know, you don't want to follow someone else's thought progression. You, you want to have your own unique thought progression as well as educating them on how to, how to use other people's ideas, how to incorporate those, you know, cite them correctly, how to give credit where it's due, but, and yet create their own unique um, contribution or demonstration of their own competence in the topic area. And then we have the behaviors. So then we do look for very specifically, are there things that are, that we can discern that are happening in what they're, what they're presenting? You know, clearly we use some kind of a plagiarism checkers. We, we do things to actually look at what students are doing. We look at their, um, their uh, behavior over time. Is there a, a, any kind of, um, uh, you know, quick change in terms of all of a sudden they excel, whereas previously perhaps there would be indications that they would struggle typically. So then we, we look at behaviors, but also then we educate. If someone submits something without proper citations, we go back and through the education loop. And then there's the consequences side of it, which is the consequences really need to be explained just so that there is that deterrent factor and, and students have the holistic picture. But again, I think our bottom line is educating these students about this behavior. I was struck by what Mark said this morning. He said, we're in a culture of, of um, case, copy and, um, and steal everything, right? He's saying that to all of us, like the good people are out there, you're learning from everybody else, you're using their ideas, you're incorporating it into what you're, what you're doing. And that's, that's a good part of our culture. The, the downside of it is helping our students understand when we're truly trying to assess what they know, what they can do, and, and help them understand when these predatory companies are, are encouraging them to cross a line that's not, um, not appropriate for what we're trying, for their um, educational journey. Yeah, I think what, what you just said, Maureen, struck a note with, with the use of open educational resources, because we definitely are in this space where we're encouraging our, our faculty and in our course design to use OERs, which is on the curricular side, right? But I think our students have also, for many of them, grown up in sort of a test taking economy where there are lots of study guides, there's Cliff Notes, there's Spark Notes, there's, you know, whatever it is out there. They're used to going out and finding the best study aid. And so I think, you know, what you said about there being sort of this distinction between what's a, what's a study aid, what's a curricular help versus okay, now you've just revealed all the assessments and answers um, in, a, in a site. There's a difference there and it's important to articulate what that is. And if I could just jump in on the, the, the uh, theme that both I think uh, uh, Jennifer and Maureen are talking about. We did a lot of research at UMUC into our students and faculty to understand some baseline uh, perceptions and behaviors and culture before we knew how to effectively intervene 
So we surveyed 145,000 students and 5,000 faculty members uh, to really understand uh, where they are. And what we found was that there, there's some pretty big gaps between faculty assumptions and student assumptions. So the first thing I think it's important if you're, if you're trying to engage this institutionally is not assume. Uh, don't assume that, that the value of integrity is, is a given uh, for your students. Not because students don't have integrity. Our students do, and they can talk about it eloquently, and they understand that faculty are their models of integrity. But um, rather than it being generational, it's the kind of uh, the cultural downstream effect of, of, of web culture having been around for, you know, almost a quarter century now. Uh, you know, think about the, the cat meme that you've probably created or received, right? You take a cat photo, you come up with some clever saying of your own, and then you shoot it out into the internet. And that's yours because you, you created that in a way, right? You think that, that I'm, I wanna share this thing, but it's not entirely yours, right? There's this patent, pastiche and mashup and mix and reuse aspect of the internet that has really permeated uh, our culture across generations. And our students bring that uh, assumption that the, the radical openness of information on the web means it's all free and it's, it's all mine in some way. Uh, and again, not necessarily perniciously, but they bring that assumption into the classroom. And I think the, the question about OER is absolutely uh, the right one because you know, we have a Creative Commons license on many of our OER that says, do anything you want to with this. But then we have some proprietary OER that we say, nope, actually that's, the, that's ours. We wanna keep that in house. And then we say, cite that thing correctly. Well, okay. and then if you don't, we're gonna go send you to the, you know, for us, policy 150.50, right? We're gonna, we're gonna send you down that road. So we need to help students understand what our values are and have a conversation educationally and developmentally about those different value systems that they're bringing to the classroom and make that part of the teaching and learning pro a process so that we're having a values-based discussion that's scaffolded across the curriculum. This is not a one and done kind of inoculatory effect of a tutorial five minutes, you know, that they sign a pledge at the end of and then go into the classroom. This has to be something more intentionally engaging across the curriculum to really, uh, uh, meet students where they are in terms of their cultural values about intellectual property and uh, information literacy. So we know what the threat is. Um, how do we get our arms around it? How do we, how do we um, secure the institution, so to speak, against uh, breaches of academic integrity? What, what's, what's the way that uh, institutions get a handle on this problem? So, you know, I think we're aggressively pursuing every action, every way we can, you know, so we'll, we'll uh, work with the education of our students and our faculty, you know, design assessments that we think are unique, it, like assessment design is one way where you can make it difficult for it to, to be something that would be um, replicated where it's it we're really trying to make it authentic assessment that the student must demonstrate their own specific competence and and really you know all those sort of things to protect but i think in the end of the day we also need to make it i was going to say painful difficult you know on, you know for the people who are in this space trying to really um attack our 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 students and their um, credibility and their um, integrity. So we are actively um, at WGU, we are actively pursuing legal action. And I can't say exactly what it is, but I, I will tell you, our lawyers have said that I can ask you to join the fight. If you are interested, if your institution's in interested, I'll um, get your contract, I'll give you contact information and we would like lawyers to lawyers to talk. They, they gave me a lot of legalese on what they're doing, but I, I think the better thing would be that if your institution's interested, they have some clear legal um, strategies that, they're, that we're using at WGU and we're, we're in the interest of sharing. This is something we're interested in sharing with all of you and asking you to help, help participate and make life difficult, make make these companies realize that really in many states what they're doing is actually illegal and make them um, bear the consequences of that. So uh, everything she said, um, and we, you know, uh, Adele and I are on calls all the time sort of uh, uh, beating the drum of, of collaboration. So yes, uh, we, UMUC is, is, is a similarly invested institution. So we've tried to take a comprehensive approach at this that, that sees it as both uh, a pedagogical strategy to enhance a culture of integrity. So assessment design, curriculum design and delivery, instructional approaches, uh, making the experience authentic to students so that um, they not only don't want to, to go down a, a different kind of path that might lead into misconduct, but it also fills in the skills gaps that are the biggest drivers for misconduct behaviors. 
Um, and that's especially true for the, the student populations that we're all educating, uh, because we know that, that they're going to bring, sometimes bring more skills gaps to, to us, even at the graduate level, uh, in, in my case, that we, we have to meaningfully engage. So there's the pedagogical side of this, and um, we've got some tools we're developing to document how and how well we're, we're engaging integrity across the curriculum. Uh, but we also have to be we have to be defensive and we have to have a robust uh, system of, of accountability and for us uh, a cyber infrastructure defense system and so we are in the process of developing five interrelated technology tools uh, this uh, project was just approved by our executive committee and funded uh, and i'll just briefly talk talk about those um, the the we're, we're kind of solve against two main threats one is student identity verification, knowing that the student is the student in the classroom at the point of entry and throughout their time with us in the classroom. And the other is to uh, respond to the mass unauthorized distribution of our teaching and learning materials, especially our assessments without authorization online. Uh, and so these five tools attempt to, to respond to that. And the first is uh, a, a vendor acquired software that is very much like what we're experiencing with um, our, our banks and financial institutions that uh, create essentially a digital fingerprint of us based on a series of data points, um, both our interactions with our devices and, and keypads, as well as our IP activity, uh, create that, that fingerprint and then score against it at the point of entry and throughout the student's session in the classroom, flagging anything suspicious that goes above the thresholds that we'll, we'll establish. Uh, the second is an authorship authentication tool, uh, which similarly uh, uses machine learning technology to establish essentially a digital voice print of the student. What does a student sound like in their writing? Uh, and semantic analysis, discourse analysis has, has really matured to be able to establish that kind of, of voice. Uh, and then again, to set some thresholds that says, yeah, let's allow for improvement in writing. We don't want to flag somebody whose writing style changes because we're actually teaching them effectively. Uh, but there are some voice changes that any of you know, I, I grew up teaching freshman comp, right? So you know when the voice changes in a way that's suspicious, right? This technology attempts to scale that uh, kind of intuitive uh, teacherly sensibility to uh, a measurable, scalable uh, detection of deviations that could signal inauthenticity, flag it, and that would be investigated. Uh, we are also developing a, a bot crawler tool that will go out, again, using machine learning technology to the 600 or so sites that we've identified as the biggest offenders, hoover up all of the material that could be UMUC and then use the machine learning technology to distinguish what it is that we can't take down. So we might see a stu student's essay on Moby Dick, for instance, but we can't legally request to take that down. Uh, even if it's on a site that someone else could use. Uh, and we don't want to take down our Creative Commons and, and openly licensed material, even if we're not thrilled that it's on one of these sites, it's still open and open is open. But there's that Goldilocks position of assessment materials that are proprietary to us and that really is where our biggest threat is exposed. And we can, we think it'll take us about three to 5,000 learning instances with the machine to teach it what it is that it, we really want to take down. And when we've identified that block of material, auto-generate legal takedown notices that will be pushed at an established cadence to these site owners on a regular basis. When Maureen talks about pushing back into this space, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We know that getting to zero is probably not a realistic goal, but we do hope to, to decrease it somewhat. And more importantly, we want these sites to know that if they have UMUC material there, they're going to be spending a lot of time responding to legal paperwork. And the final tool is to integrate our, our misconduct case management into the same CRM platforms that attach to uh, the tools I just described, so that the data flowing out of these that often generate misconduct or um, uh, acceptable use policy violations, the evidence is all flowed into the same system and we can have data analytics capabilities to ultimately uh, predict and intervene where we think the, the cheating is about to happen next, most likely. Mm -hmm. And I would say I'm going to take just a, a slightly different tack for a moment. I think those are really important interventions to make and uh, my institution is also exploring some ways to do similar things in terms of identity verification. I would say we're not as far down the road, and so I would like to you know, keep working with you on that. And I think it's particularly some of our, our vendors who can use some of those tools in terms of the keyboard strokes and things like that. Just to kind of reverse the conversation for a moment, I wanted to come back around to uh, some of the points that Mark made this morning, because I think one thing we're working on is this idea of trying to help create a personalized journey for the student. And that's not to say that there aren't bad, bad actors or sites that are you know, taking you know, pernicious actions, but this sense that if we can um, help the student to become invested and known in such a way uh, that they are dedicated to this enterprise that they're part of, I think that's an important 
deterrent to some of this to this behavior and, and in particular you know with our students they love the flexibility of taking these courses online they love having it fit their schedule they love the ability to kind of pace their program the way that they want to but they don't want to feel anonymous uh, we've done a lot of listen and learns around the country with different student groups and they say hey we like being able to go into the class but we want the faculty member to know who we are we want them to know about us uh, we don't want to get canned responses we we want to have this very authentic kind of relationship with the faculty member throughout and we want the the institution to know who who i am so if i'm calling in i want them to to know my history i don't want to get you know pushed around from one unit to another and so we've we've been also working on the the side of student of outreach to students um, for instance we're using one of the civitas tools inspire for faculty in the classroom uh, which gives the faculty a heat map of students engagement and their current activity and how well they're doing in the class and allows the faculty to send some personalized responses based on the groups of students they identify who maybe are doing great congratulations that's wonderful what can i do to help you continue or i notice you haven't been in the class for a while what's going on there now that is not necessarily going to prevent a contract cheating situation if someone's logging in as someone else. But I think it creates the kind of positive environment that we're looking for in terms of the student being known to the faculty member and the other way around, you know, that it's not an anonymous environment in that class. Yeah, I think that I, we kind of went backwards in time, but I do think we find all our students really support these efforts because it protects the quality of their degree, it protects, it, it makes their education meaningful to them. And, and I think it, it also is part of, um, you know, really there's very few people engaging in this, in, in um, what you were calling bad behavior or um, the, the kind of cheating. And so why, why color the experience for everybody as a whole, just because of a few few. So by being aggressive and really working these issues, I think we really make the educational journey better for all the students at our institutions. Yeah, you mentioned uh, reputational risk and I uh, just to, so I can channel Adele. Uh, I know he likes to talk about the risk to the credentialing function. Uh, of the university or the college in the marketplace. That is, uh, if, if, if uh, higher education in general or, or a particular institution um, loses the confidence uh, of the market that its degrees or, or, or other credentials uh, really uh, indicate something about learning, uh, then you put your students at a disadvantage uh, in the market and you put the institution at risk in terms of student recruitment. Um, so, a lot of great efforts. How do you measure the results? I mean, is it, uh, you know, kind of tracking back-end data out of turnitin.com? Is it number of student uh, cases uh, that have, have declined? Um, Douglas, you mentioned uh, going to the executive committee and getting funding. Did they ask you the question, well, okay, we're willing to give you the money. What are the metrics? Yeah, you have to have, you have, to have metrics. Um, so we think that it's, it's, some of, it's a mix of all of those things. Um, uh, first, we think measuring student learning is, is not unrelated here. Now, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, but we do think that um, implementing at scale around both the pedagogical and teaching learning components, as well as the cyber infrastructure tools, when you put all that together, uh, you've got a suite of interventions that really um, you ought to see show up. Now, it could show up in uh, the rate of success, it could show up in fewer W's uh, because often misconduct can go down a path where, you know, a, a student ends up, you know, uh, dropping out of, of, of the system with you. Uh, so you have to be sophisticated how you measure those things, but absolutely we think teaching and learning is at least one dimension outcomes are, are student learning outcomes. Uh, but we absolutely with these tools had to set, set benchmarks. So uh, we set benchmarks for uh, the number of uh, takedown notices we hoped to target in the in the development phase, the first quarter and subsequent quarters. Uh, we also set some targets for at least a few of the most prominent and well-known offenders. We set some modest but meaningful targets about seeing a, a decline of our material there, trying to do the analysis to realize that it, it's often a cat and mouse game that it's really hard, hard to um, hard to hard to be the, the cat, frankly. Um, 
So we, we set those benchmarks. Uh, we also set um, some, uh, some benchmarks in, in our case, our misconduct caseload outcomes. Uh, so beginning to track what kinds of cases we see uh, and part of our larger effort around pedagogy has, has been to get at policy. And we haven't really talked about policy much, but it's a really important component of this to have the right policies that respond to the 21st century landscape of integrity and misconduct. Um, we've got a 20th, 20th century policy right now that we're overhauling. So one of the things we're introducing is a sense of leveling in our misconduct uh, uh, violations so that we identify those skills-based or skills gaps-based violations in misconduct that really need to be remediated through instructional and developmental approaches that don't penalize someone for what they don't know and what we may not have always been as effective at teaching them. Uh, and, and then to, to step up to more egregious, but maybe uh, again, not necessarily um, irremediable situations. So that's usually a mix of punitive and developmental. Uh, and, and then kind of your, you know, DEFCON three or four level, where at some point the egregiousness and the persistence of the behavior really requires us to separate with the, with the student. Um, and we've really had to be aware that we, we've, we have to have a process for revoking degrees. And so we, we've kind of stepped through uh, those four levels to make sure that we have all the right tools at hand uh, and that the outcomes generated by those processes when you put them all together is the way that we presented to our executive team the, the kinds of uh, measurements and data points we're gonna be looking at to see if we're, if we're being effective. So I'm gonna make perhaps arguably an analogous case to this, which was uh, earlier in the history of online education, and we saw this at our institution, there, was, there were people who were signing up um, to get the financial aid and never intending to go to school was the whole financial fraud question. And I think this is in some ways perhaps the next generation in, from the academic side. You know, in our particular uh, instance, we spent a, quite a lot of institutional people energy and time figuring out processes to try to circumvent those who were applying to get the financial aid. And some of that was identity theft, unfortunately, which is really scary when someone else is stealing someone's identity and then trying to get financial aid on that person's identity, not a good thing. So we've now kind of figured out how to prevent those folks from getting on board. And what was very interesting is once we did that in terms of our federal financial aid students, the legitimate ones, you know, the outcomes for those students completely turned around because now we have people in school who are actually coming to school to go to school. Um, so I think we're kind of at a similar point in time with this uh, contract cheating issue. And one other thing, sort of switching topics here, you know, in terms of that culture that I think everyone is describing here having that as central to our institutional learning outcomes has been really important. You know, having the integrity and information literacy kind of component really deeply embedded in the curriculum, I think is, it's a start. It's not going to prevent all, but it's important that it's apparent that it's measured. It's part of the program review process. It's part of the regular uh, curricular assessment. And that kind of keeps it at a, at a central place. So we want to hear more from our panelists. So let's do it uh, for the next 10 minutes uh, through your questions. So are there, are there questions in the room or maybe questions remotely? Uh, uh, gentleman in the back. Yeah, let me get the mic. Oh, okay. I don't think I need a mic. For the, I mean, for the remote people. All right, we're on the Johnny Carson show or something. Yeah, I'm dating myself. Uh, yeah, just a couple of questions. Um, you guys, I realize you guys are, are, I'd say, mostly online. You know, I don't know, 90%, you know, maybe 100%. Um, but um, I guess one of the things I wanted to ask, I had something written down here. Um, do you get much pushback when you try, like when you guys talk to um, the, I guess, traditional institutions about this? Do you get much pushback because... I, I kind of feel like some of the traditional institutions, they, they don't think that this is that rampant because it's, uh, they've got more face-to-face -face classes and they don't think the issues, you know, so big with face-to-face. -face. And then, but they're just kind of letting us do what we can to stop the online, you know, the online may be kind of, you know, on the back burner and they don't care about that. And then the other thing I wanted to, if you could comment on that, but the other thing is, 
Um, I teach math online and, you know, we have a policy to have at least a final exam proctored. And uh, th there's a little bit of encouragement now to have a midterm and final proctored. And so I'm just curious uh, how, what your stance would be on a proctored exam, because that is generally, I see both sides, that's generally more secure, but yet on the other hand, it's a real pain to try to deal with proctored exams when people live all over the country and are take, trying to take your class. So, thank you. Thanks. I, you know, I think we want to be really clear that this is not just an online problem. We really honestly believe it's, it's a very big issue um, in, in, in any, institu any educational institution or anyone doing any assessment of competency, even probably people who are doing ones for professional certifications and, you know, uh, this is an issue. It's there, there's this cheating economy and that's what we're trying to make sure people are aware of with the view that by educating people about this economy that you can take uh, steps to prevent it. But I think we, because we are totally online and we assess competency, that is our that is how we do not measure seat time. We don't measure attendance at um, lectures. That's why it's so critical to us. We, we really passionately believe that we must be able to say that this is the person who took the assessment and this is their own competence that they demonstrated because that's really the core and the heart of what we're saying when we give that student a degree or a credential. And, and you use security measures to, I'm sorry. And you use security measures to identify the students, like if they're taking an exam yes. or, or something on, on something like that. Every whereas whereas uh, a lot of our institutions, they don't really want to put out the funds to to you know for proctor you or other services like that so that's something we're dealing with but we we view it as an investment in our university's um credibility in our in the credibility of the degree we're presenting you know that the money isn't as important as being able to say with a clear clear vision that this is that student and this is their competence and and we're committed to that I don't want to take up too much time, but just briefly to the first part of your question. I, I think if, if traditional uh, residential institutions don't think they've got a problem, go to one of these sites and search their, your institutional name uh, and, and see how many thousands of documents come up. And also realize that even if, you're, if you primarily think this isn't a problem because you're giving face-to-face -face and even proctored exams, um, okay, but think about alignment to curriculum and what authentic assessment looks like. There are some places where, where objective direct examination is aligned and there's a lot of places where we fall back on it um, for a lot of reasons that a lot of other panels at these kind of conferences can talk about. But I, I would just say that, that, that that's a kind, of, kind of the way to prize open that conversation with, with, with institutions. Yeah, I was kind of playing that Hi, uh, I have a quick question for you. Um, are you doing anything different to address the needs of international students, particularly those who might be coming from pluralistic societies, where it's the norm for students to actually work together? We actually are based just US, but we have a lot of people who culturally, when we have our first level, perhaps of remediation discussions, we have found that that is a, that is, that is a real issue where culturally, there, this is not perceived to be, um, you know, uh, cheating or, or to not be authentic. So that is part of the huge role that we take is to outreach, educate, help people understand exactly um, why it's important that they're demonstrating their own competent knowledge of the, under, of the subject material. A similar, certainly in the writing resources and the information literacy uh, modules and curricular components that are there. Uh, they really do talk a lot about authorship and what that means. You know, our, our research ethics curriculum, which is more prevalent at the master's level, you know, also does a lot with authorship, obviously, and attribution of different components of the research. So I, I think there's definitely sort of cultural differences internationally. There's, to go back to the mashup kind of culture thing here, you know, there's different understandings of of what it means to work with somebody else's material and, and how okay that is in different contexts. Mm -hmm. I think we've got time for maybe one more question, so. Great, thanks. I'm really interested in the technological approaches that UMUC, um, that, that you mentioned that you were using 
And I'm wondering if these were tools that you developed in-house or these are vendors that you're working with. You mentioned something about a digital, measuring the digital footprint, the authorship voice tool and the bot crawler tool. It's a mix. So the identity authentication tool that creates a digital fingerprint is a, is a vendor tool. Um, I could talk to you offline about uh, some of the different ones we've, we've uh, worked with and, and who we ultimately ended up, up with. But these are highly validated technologies that are, you know, standard in, in banking, financial, and other um, uh, authenticate, where authentication is a, is a high risk. Um, we really tried hard to find uh, a partner or a vendor for the bot tool. Uh, there are a couple of out there. Um, and uh, just because of the, there, there, there aren't as many of them and that's not as a mature technology, uh, we ultimately ended up uh, developing that in-house. Uh, it's using the same machine learning technology as the authorship authentication tool in terms of, uh, of the underlying learning uh, behaviors in, in the tool. Uh, so we it made sense for us to develop that authorship authentication tool um, for us. I will say that um, Turnitin does have a version of authorship authentication. I think they call it author, somebody help me out here. Uh, they've tried to roll that out um, internationally. Uh, and they, I think they're looking for partners in this because they're, they're, they're um, running into a couple of problems, I think. One is, uh, one is cultural resistance of the sort we've talked about. Um, and also another is resource. Uh, when you start using these tools, they generate a lot of data very, very quickly, and it takes a lot of institutional infrastructure and expertise. That's people and policies and processes for governing how that data flows through your system. Um, that's one reason we want partnerships because we think something we do have with that. Um, we think that's something we can contribute as a large institution, uh, and we would like to help institutions that we know don't always have the resources or the scale to do this, but who have these same challenges. And so, when we talk about wanting partners. That's what we think one thing a coalition can do is really help to, to scale out these technologies. Um, and I can talk more about these two if you'd like um, offline. Yes, and we also have very similar approaches and I think that there's opportunities for us to all leverage that technology and those tools so that everybody doesn't have to invent the wheel. But there is a certain commitment to follow up legally, legally take the action afterwards. Jennifer. I was just going to say one 30 second addendum to that, which is on the flip side of the cybersecurity is right now the privacy rules. And we're spending probably more time on GDPR than we are on anything else right at the moment. And, you know, not only us, but our vendors have to show that they're GDPR compliant. So that's just one added twist to this whole conversation. So I think uh, we're at time, unfortunately. It's been a really engaging uh, conversation this afternoon. So again, we want to thank uh, Quality Matters for putting this uh, issue front and center um, and uh, giving our panelists an opportunity to talk about uh, their work in this area. Thank you for your questions. You've got several invitations up here to, to uh, get more information about tools or to join uh, the crusade against the cheating economy. Uh, so we hope some of you will come up and, uh, and talk with us. So thank you very much.